Well, good morning, welcome. Good to have you with us today. It's great to see you, and thank you for joining us if you're on uh, YouTube as well. Uh, we're going to begin by reading Isaiah 35. Isaiah 35. This is a, a chapter about um, something amazing happening in the wilderness, in, in the desert, a place of dryness and, and death, and then suddenly there is joy and life. God makes a way for his people to come to him. And we're reading this because it will tie in with what we're going to see later on this morning as well. So if you have a Bible there, turn to Isaiah 35, or uh, just listen along as I read the chapter. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the splendour of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendour of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs. In the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. And a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. The unclean will not journey on it. It will be for those who walk in that way. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor will any ferocious beast get up on it. They will not be found there, but only the redeemed will walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Well, keep that in mind because we're going to be looking at God providing a way in the wilderness later on. But let's pray together now. Let's pray. Our God and Father, as we come together this morning, we acknowledge that we often live in a place of dryness and of death, a world where uh, life comes to an end all too quickly. And a world where we are spiritually dry and lifeless, where we sin, we confess to you that we have sinned this week. And so we praise you for that wonderful chapter that we've read, that you bring joy and life in the wilderness. That in dry places you make streams burst forth and flowers grow up. We thank you for that promise of a return to you, that you will make a way of holiness for your people to walk on. We thank you too for the promise of strength to the weary and of comfort for the fearful. Pray for those of us this morning who are feeling like that. May you be our comfort, our strength. May we not fear because we know that you have come in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ to save us. That if we are your people, we have nothing to fear, that the outcome in the end is secure. We thank you for that promise that the Lord will come to save his people. That in Jesus Christ he has come and will come again to put everything right. We pray this morning... Uh, for the children among us as they go back to school this week. We pray that you would uh, keep them healthy and safe. Pray that the things that they learn would be good and true. Pray that they would learn discernment and how to get on well with people. We pray that we as parents and as a church family would be able to answer questions and talk to them about the things that they uh, come home having learnt at school. We pray for the uh, many who heard your word read and, and sung about at the funeral of Prince Philip yesterday. We pray that that will have 
caused people to consider that life is short, that they would seek a saviour in Jesus Christ. Pray that you'd help us this week, if maybe we're talking about it with friends and family, with work colleagues, to point to Christ as our certain hope in life and death. And we pray that this morning as we hear your word, as we sing your praise, that you would fill us with joy and life, that you would bring springs where perhaps there is dryness, where we're feeling dry this morning. Please turn our hearts to you in worship. Through our Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Okay, well I'm going to talk to you children for a minute now, okay. Imagine, right, that you were at the park and you met somebody who told you that he was the fastest runner in the whole world. Would you believe him? Put your hand up if you'd believe him. I'll tell you what, I'll show you a picture of him, shall I? Here he is. Do you think? Is that the fastest runner in the whole world? Probably not. I think his legs are a bit short, aren't they, at the minute? People often say things like that, don't they? You probably shouldn't believe them just because they say it, okay? How could you find out? You could have a race, couldn't you? I expect you could run faster than that little boy, and then you'd know that he wasn't the fastest runner in the world. Okay, well, let's imagine that you meet somebody else, all right? Here's a second person, and he tells you that he's the fastest runner in the world. Would you believe him? Put your hand up if you believe that he's the fastest runner in the world. You would, okay. You're the only one. No one else. Hmm. I see. It's a bit more difficult, isn't it? Maybe he is the fastest. You could have a race with him, but I think he'd probably be faster than most of us, wouldn't he? Because he looks like he does a lot of running. He'd probably zoom off, and we still wouldn't know if he was the fastest in the world or not. But if he just tells you himself, I'm not sure you should believe it just because someone says it about themselves, should you? Maybe you'd want some proof. Okay, so let's think about a third person. This third person, he tells you that he's the fastest runner in the world as well. Okay? But this one is a bit different. He shows you something. This is what he shows you. An Olympic gold medal. And he tells you his name and you go home and you get out the Guinness Book of Records, and you look up the fastest runner in the world, and it's got his name next to it. Would you believe that this man is the fastest runner in the world? Who would believe it? Yeah, I think you could believe it, couldn't you? Some of you are still a bit sceptical, but I think we could believe that, couldn't we? He's given us some proof. It's not just him telling you that he's the fastest. Other people have said he's the fastest as well. The Olympics, they've said he's the fastest. And Guinness Book of Records, they've said he's the fastest. So if somebody says that they're very special, we shouldn't just believe it because they say they are. We want some proof. We want other people to tell us that they are as well, don't we? So, now let's think about a fourth person. What about Jesus? What about Jesus? Jesus claims that he's the Christ, that he's the king of the universe. He claims that he's the son of God, that he's God himself. How can we know that what Jesus says is true, that he's not just making it up? Well, is it because he says it? Well, actually, no, it's not. Jesus says, if I testify about myself... My testimony is not valid. That means if Jesus just tells you something about himself, well, you shouldn't necessarily believe it. We need some evidence, don't we? We need some witnesses. And Jesus gives us some witnesses, okay, so that we can believe it. He says there's another who testifies about me. It's not just that Jesus tells you himself. There's somebody else. You've sent messengers to John, and he has testified to the truth. So John the Baptist says that that's who Jesus is. So we've got someone else, we've got some witnesses, and there's someone even greater than John who tells us who Jesus is. Jesus says, I have a greater testimony than John's. The Father who sent me has himself testified about me. So Jesus just doesn't, doesn't just say it about himself. 
It doesn't just have John the Baptist to say it. God the Father also says that Jesus is his son, the Christ. And if God says it, then we can really believe it, can't we? So it's, it's sensible to have evidence to believe something, and God gives us evidence in the Bible so that we can believe that Jesus is who he says he is. And this morning, as we look at another part of the Bible, we're going to see some of these same things, okay? So look out for that when we read it and talk about it together this morning. So let's read another part of the Bible together now. Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. And I hope you'll see some of the same sorts of things that we've been talking about in this chapter, okay? Mark chapter 1, the first 13 verses. This is what it says. The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John came, baptising in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptised by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt round his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one <clears throat> more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptise you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. At that time Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert for forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. Okay, we're going to look at that together in a moment, but we're going to sing first of all, Come People of the Risen King. So we'll stand to sing. Jesus. 
Okay, so do turn back to Mark chapter 1, if you have a Bible there. Well, yesterday was the funeral of Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, wasn't it? And that was an event with particular significance for two villages on the island of Tanna, which is part of Vanuatu. They believe that Prince Philip was the descendant of a very powerful god who lives on one of their mountains. Now, are they right about that? How can we know? There are many claims to be God, aren't there? There are many beliefs about who God is. We live in a a multicultural society where many gods are worshipped. It was predicted that as people got more educated, religion would just die out, but that's not happened, that's not the case. The reason is that we were made to worship, we were designed to worship. And if we stop worshipping God, we don't worship nothing, people worship all kinds of things instead. So I wonder what it is that you worship. The thing that you worship is the thing that you build your life on, the thing that if it was taken out from under you, your life would be turned upside down, the thing that you rely on for security, the thing that you think is going to give you happiness. For some people, that is a a, a recognised religion. For some people, it's family or career or money. For some people, it's Prince Philip, the son of the mountain god. How can we tell who or what is worthy of our worship? Of course, Prince Philip is not the only person to be worshipped as the son of a god, is he? Here's another one. Uh, This is found on an inscription near Ephesus. It says, The birthday of the god marked for the world the beginning of good tidings through his coming. Good tidings there is the word gospel. The birth of the god marked the beginning of the gospel. That's what it says. So who's that talking about? Well, it's talking about Caesar Augustus, the Roman emperor. He was worshipped as a god who had brought peace to the world. And almost at the same time that that inscription was carved, another person who claimed to be the son of God appeared. We find his inscription in Mark 1 and verse 1, the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, I'm pretty sure that none of us here this morning, and probably none of us watching online, worship Prince Philip as the Son of a God. And nobody today worships Caesar Augustus in that way, do they? And yet billions of people all over the world, including most of us here, do worship Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Why is Jesus different? Why does his claim stand scrutiny while these other claims have disappeared into history? Why should we take notice of him? Well, this morning we're beginning a series looking at the gospel according to Mark. And that's exactly what Mark is aiming to do for us, to present Jesus so that we can see him and we can understand and we can ultimately accept and believe his claim to be the Christ, the Son of God. In Jesus, the guessing about what God is like and how he should be worshipped comes to an end. God reveals himself as Jesus walks off the pages of the scriptures. Mark is the shortest of the four Gospels and he writes in a really kind of snappy way, just records short snapshots, incidents, so that we can understand who Jesus really was. 
Mark's Gospel is almost certainly written by the Mark that we read about in uh, the book of Acts, and almost certainly based on the Apostle Peter's account of Jesus. It was probably written around AD 60, so well within the lifetime of people who had met Jesus, who had seen him. The lifetime of the, the crowds that we read about, they could say whether what Mark had written down had actually happened or not. And Mark starts his gospel with that heading, the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The gospel is a, uh, or a gospel is a kind of official announcement. So when a war came to an end, or when there was a new king crowned, a, a gospel would be announced, that the announcement that some good thing has happened. And the gospel that Mark announces is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. <coughs> Jesus is the the name that was given to Jesus when he was, when he was born. It was a fairly common name, means God saves or God is salvation. And Christ is a title. It's the word for a special, unique, God-appointed king who would come and reign. A king who would bring worldwide peace, who would bring people back into a relationship with God. Mark's aim is for us to see that Jesus really is that one, that he is the Christ, that he is the Son of God, that he is worthy of worship. Now, some of you, I'm sure, have been uh, involved in interviewing people for jobs. How do you go about uh, appointing somebody to a job? Well, you read the application forms, don't you? And the CVs or whatever it is that people have to submit. You interview them, you see what they've got to say for themselves. But a really important step, maybe the most important step, is collecting references, isn't it? You can't just rely on what that person says about themselves. People will say all sorts of things if they want a job. You want to check that other people's testimony about them lines up with what they claim. And Mark's Gospel begins the same way. Before we hear from Jesus himself, before we see what Jesus can do, we're given some glowing references by others. That's what we're going to see in these verses from chapter 1 this morning. Uh, Four references that Jesus is given. First of all, he's announced by the prophets. Verse 2. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. Now, the quote in verse 2 is actually from the prophet Malachi, and the one in verse 3 is from Isaiah. In those days, it was okay just to kind of quote the most important uh, person that you were were quoting. That's why Mark names Isaiah at the beginning there. And the thing to notice is that in verse 3, where Isaiah says, prepare the way for the Lord, the word that's translated Lord there (coughs) is the word Yahweh. It's the, the covenant name of God. Isaiah's announcement is that God himself is coming. The creator and the ruler of the universe is going to come into his world. But before he comes, someone else will come, a messenger who will get people ready for the coming of the Lord. And the very last verses of the Old Testament in Malachi 4 say that the prophet who comes will be like the prophet Elijah. He's come to prepare people to meet God. So with that, uh, that news, that prophecy from the, the prophets in our ears, what happens? Well, verse 4, John comes. And John did exactly what we'd expect someone to do, to prepare people for the coming of the Lord. If you knew that you were going to meet God tomorrow, what would you do? Well, if you had any knowledge at all of the, the God of the Bible, I think what you'd do is be repenting of your sin asking God to forgive you. And so that's what John does when he comes, isn't it? He prepares people for meeting the Lord, for the Lord's coming, by telling them to repent and ask for God's forgiveness. And he symbolises that with baptism. Normally baptism was something that that non-Jews did when they wanted to become Jews. But here it's Jewish people, the whole Judean countryside and and Jerusalem who are coming out and being baptised. They realise they're not in the right with God. They're not in the proper relationship with God. They need to put things right before he comes. Then in verse 6, we're told what it is that John wore. Clothing made of camel's hair 
and a leather belt round his waist. Now that wasn't normal clothing in those days, in case you're wondering. So why does Mark tell us about John's fashion sense? Well, the reason is that uh, back in 2 Kings chapter 1, we get a description of Elijah the prophet. Look at these verses. Uh, back there in 2 Kings, the king asks, What kind of man was he who came to meet you and told you these things? They answered him, He wore a garment of hair with a belt of leather about his waist. And he said, It's Elijah the Tishmite. So can you see, John is wearing the uniform of Elijah, the distinctive dress of Elijah the prophet. <coughs> so can you see that John is fulfilling what the prophets announced hundreds of years before? The prophets announced that a messenger like Elijah would appear in the desert to prepare the way for the Lord. And here is John, he's dressed like Elijah. He's in the desert eating desert food, locusts and wild honeys, no McDonald's out in the desert, that's all you can get. And he's preparing people for the Lord's coming. And so now expectation should be at fever pitch, shouldn't it? There's only one more thing left to happen, and that is for the Lord himself to come, for God to step into his world. And John announces that the Lord is coming, verse 7. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. The one who is coming is someone so much greater than John, even though John is a great prophet. John is not worthy even to do the most menial task for him. And although John prepares people by baptising them with water, the one who is coming does something infinitely greater, baptises them with God the Holy Spirit himself. Now Caesar Augustus persuaded people that he was a son of God by minting thousands of coins with special symbols on and pictures of himself and he constructed huge buildings and dedicated them to himself. But Jesus is not self-proclaimed, is he? He doesn't begin by announcing himself. He's announced as the son of God before he even appears on the scene. In fact, he's announced hundreds of years before he even appears by the prophets. He fulfills what the prophets say. We don't have to rely on his testimony about himself. So that's Jesus' first reference. He's announced by the prophets. <clears throat> but that's nothing compared to what happens next. The next two, Jesus is anointed and acknowledged by God. The prophets foretell the Lord will come in the desert. John announces that one vastly greater than him is coming. We're, we're full of expectancy. The next thing that we see, verse 9, is that this man, Jesus, comes from a little village called Nazareth. Is he the one? Well, he's baptised by John, like many others. But when he comes out of the water, there are two things that are like no one else. Two dramatic signs that Jesus really is the Christ, the Son of God. First of all, he's anointed by the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, priests and kings are anointed with oil for their, their God-given role. And Jesus is declared here to be God's priest and king in a much greater way, not just oil on, his, on him, but the Holy Spirit comes down to rest on him. The crowd see that. And then secondly, Jesus is acknowledged by God the Father. A voice from heaven announces, you are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. This isn't something that human beings could do, is it? This was long before the days of loudspeakers and holographic projectors and all that kind of thing. They're out in the middle of the desert. These are signs from heaven, from God, done in the full view and hearing of the crowds. God himself confirms what Mark writes in verse 1. Jesus is the Christ. He is God's beloved Son. Now maybe we wonder why Jesus was baptised at all. It's a good question to ask, isn't it? We read that John's baptism was for forgiveness of sins, for repentance, but Jesus is the Son of God. He didn't have any sins to confess. He didn't need to be forgiven. 
So why was he baptised? Well, later on in his Gospel, Mark tells us about another baptism of Jesus as well. Jesus refers to his death on the cross as a baptism. And we could ask the same question about that, couldn't we? If Jesus didn't have any sin, why did he die on the cross? Why did he go through that second baptism? The answer is that he was doing for us what we needed to do. Our sins required that we face God's judgment. But Jesus took our place. He went through judgment on our behalf. And the same thing that applies to that second baptism on the cross applies to this first baptism here, right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. The water symbolises our sin, our judgment that we deserve. And although Jesus doesn't have to, He steps right into our sinful mess. He's engulfed by the waters of judgment to show what he's come to do. He's come to walk in our world, to take on our sin, to go through judgment in our place. His whole life is a life of doing what he had no need to do, but he came to do in order to save his people, the people he loves. I think it's significant, isn't it, that the Holy Spirit is revealed in the form of a dove. Maybe we don't really think about that, we just uh, accept that that's the way it is, but but why a dove? The Holy Spirit isn't a dove, of course, he just took on the form of a dove. Why a dove? He could have come down as a, a blazing fire, couldn't he? Jesus could have been revealed as a figure of terror. But he's revealed as one who is gentle and lowly, full of grace, a kindness, mercy as he comes to save people. And I think it's right as well to think of the other famous dove in the Bible, the one that Noah sent out to find dry land. After the floodwaters of judgment, the dove goes out to show that a, a new world has been revealed, that new life is possible. Can you see the connection here? Jesus passes through the waters of judgment And the dove comes to show that in him a new world has dawned, new life is now possible because the Lord has come. So the prophets announce that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Not only that, much much more so, he's anointed and acknowledged by God. Jesus' references come from the highest possible authority. There can be no surer recommendation, can there? And then finally, Jesus is approved by testing, verses 12 and 13. This is one of those places where Jesus gives much less detail than Matthew or Luke. He tells us very little about Jesus' temptation. Uh, let's just read from verse 12. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert for 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. Mark doesn't say much, but he's just making one big point, I think. His point is that Jesus is tempted by Satan and wins. That's the point, isn't it? Jesus goes out into the desert. He's surrounded by wild animals. This is a hostile place. This is Satan's home turf. Jesus is there for 40 days as Satan throws everything at him. And yet Jesus emerges victorious. He has not sinned under the worst attacks of the devil. Jesus is stronger than Satan. And these few verses should make us think of other places in the Bible as well, two other places. The first place is Adam. Think of Adam, he wasn't in the desert, was he? He was in paradise. And he wasn't surrounded by animals that were trying to eat him, he was surrounded by friendly animals. But when Adam was tempted by Satan, he sinned. And it should make us think as well of the Israelites in the Old Testament. After they came out of Egypt, they were in the desert with wild animals. God called the Israelites his son. But they sinned as well, didn't they? They turned away from God and worshipped idols. But now here is Jesus, the son of God, the one who goes into the realm of evil and returns undefeated. Finally, Here is one who is stronger than Satan, who remains sinlessly faithful to God, the one who is the true Son of God. 
And so those are Jesus' references for the position of Christ, the Son of God. He's not self-appointed. He was announced by the prophets hundreds of years in advance. And even more importantly, he was proclaimed by God to be his beloved Son. He was empowered by the Holy Spirit. And he has begun already to show that he can defeat sin and Satan. His references are impeccable. He is the one who deserves to be worshipped as Lord and God. So what is it that you worship? Who is it that you worship? <clears throat> what references do they come with? What evidence is there that that thing can supply the peace or happiness or security that you long for? How does it stack up against Jesus? Let's pray, shall we? Our God and Father, we thank you that you have come into the world in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, that that event that you foretold so many years before has happened and we can know about it, that the Lord has come, the creator of the universe has entered his creation, lived as one of us. We thank you that you have provided evidence, testimony about him so that we can believe. Help us, we pray, to take that evidence seriously, to listen to the testimony that you have given. We thank and praise you that Jesus came not in terror, but gently, that he came to walk through the judgment that we deserve in our place to restore us to you, our Heavenly Father. And so we pray that you would help us to examine our hearts today, help us to see what it is that we are worshipping. Jesus Christ is the only one worthy of our worship, and so we pray that you would uh, turn us to him, perhaps for the first time, perhaps uh, with renewed love and worship and praise. May he be all our worship, we ask. Amen. Well, we're going to sing praise to God now. O oh God, beyond all praising. So we'll stand up with the music. Joyful duty, a sacrifice. 
Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen. So we need to leave fairly promptly from the back. Uh, don't forget to book for next week.